Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Bogart. I'm Managing Principal of Bogart Wealth. Uh, today, I'm going to do a talk on how do discount rates affect uh, the Excel Mobile lump sum calculations. Uh, but by way of quick introduction, uh, Bogart Wealth is a registered investment advisory firm. So we are true fiduciaries for our clients. Our core competencies are um, investment management, financial planning, and tax optimization. Not any one of the three are more important than the other. Um, we do have, oops. Excuse me. We do have uh, 15 people on our team now. <laughs> um, we have three offices, one in McLean, Virginia, one in Houston, Texas, and then one in the Woodlands, Texas. Our mission is to help our clients to achieve financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. Um, I frequently will say your kids and your parents uh, are some of the largest variables of any financial plans. And uh, we've made it part of our firm's culture to give them access to certified financial planners. And uh, I like to frequently will say, what, do you, what would you do differently now that you know what you know, but when you're back in your 20s? Um, so we've been doing these webinars uh, mostly in response to COVID-19, but it is part of a, a bigger presentation series that we do. Um, we do one on the retirement planning timeline. We do one on retirement income planning. We do one on social security, one on tax optimization strategies, one on estate planning strategies, one on NUA and post-retirement strategies one on long-term care and long-term care insurance, and one on Ross versus traditional 401ks and IRAs. Um, this list came from our audience, and, and honestly, we've been adding these new webinar talks based upon little uh, micro topics that people would like to hear us present on. If there's anything you'd like to hear, please feel free, just let me know. Um, at a minimum, I'll add in to the existing list that we have, or I'll adjust an existing presentation uh, to make sure that uh, we're, we're delivering some timely data. Um, so today we're gonna talk about how to dis uh, how do discount rates affect the Exxon Mobil lump sum? Uh, before I dive in, I just administratively, I probably should have said it at the beginning, but I do have the, uh, the Q&A uh, section open as well as the chat bar open. So if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to uh, just type them in there. I'll do my absolute best. I did get a couple of questions ahead of the presentation. I'll make sure that I address those um, as well. So before we get into kind of the, the lump sum calculation in itself, I wanted to spend a quick minute on how the pension programs are derived. Um, I like this slide, uh, even though it's actually very, very dated, it's from 2007, but it does help with understanding what the formula itself is. So uh, the, the formula for the pension is actually relatively simple. It's 1.6 times uh, I would employees years of service times the average monthly pensionable pay. Uh, if they're under the age of 62, there is a little bit of a social security reduction. Uh, and, and then that determines what is the single life annuity option. Now, <clears throat> with that, we then can apply a discount rate and that will then determine what the lump sum value is. Um, I will give Pete in our office credit. He's built a phenomenal uh, tool to be, be able to help us with calculating the sensitivities of, of interest rates on lump sums. Uh, we've modeled it based upon these formula, formulas um, so for both age groups of clientele, um, if, if you have any questions or if you have legacy extended periods of service or we're part of an acquisition, please let us know. I know that uh, the benefits group's relatively delayed in getting out some of their projections, uh, just given the volume that they're seeing right now. All right, so we talk about how it gets to the lump sum value. Now, in 2006 uh, was the Pension Protection Act. And what this did was it actually clarified the rules associated with any company that's offering a lump sum option within the pension program. It defined the discount rates to be used, it defined the actuarial tables to be used, and then it had a couple other changes that also uh, benefited anyone who had retirement accounts. Specifically, it allowed non-spousal beneficiaries uh, to do rollovers. It clarified that we could use after-tax funds within a, a retirement account and roll those over to a Roth IRA. It also clarified that company matches can be diversified. Many of you might remember that in order to get the extra 1% in your 401ks, you had to have it all go to stock. Um, it was after 2006 that you can still get the 7% match, but you can have it go into the diversified options. It also uh, clarified what IRA and 401k contribution limits were going to be going forward. Now, because of this change, um, it effectively created two groups within ExxonMobil, what we call the grandfather group, and what we call basically everyone else, non-grandfathered. Now, for the grandfather group, um, it was defined as those that were over 50 by the end of 2007 and had more than 10 years of service uh, before January 1st, 2008. 
and, and this they say we say no no the old rules apply but really it's you know it's it's no change in terms of the structure now more simplistically uh you can think of it in the sense that you were either 55 and had 15 years of service by december 31 2012 or you were born before 1958 and had hired before 1998. now the math for this age group is actually extremely simple it's 95 percent of the 30-year treasury rate and they round it up or down to the nearest quarter point uh, the other thing with this age group is uh, they do use the exxon mobile year 2000 mortality table so that's correct it has not been updated in the last 20 years now here's the trend for what we've seen for treasury rates done and, and obviously you can see going all the way back to 1980 trends been down uh, we had a little bit of a blip up but they've continued to stay at lower rates and so what we've done in terms of helping with model this is we do know that the first quarter uh, rates were at 2.25. We know that the second quarter 2019 rates were 2.25. We also know that the third quarter rates went down to 1.75. And we're now doing modeling or projections for the fourth quarter uh, with the 30 year treasury rates currently at around 1.3, 1.35. Uh, we are actually now projecting that the, uh, the, the discount rate for the fourth quarter is going to be somewhere around 1.25. Um, it'll be a new historic low if it stays there. I'd say, you know, for planning purposes, it's a safe assumption that we will see at least 1.5. Uh, but in order for the discount rate to, to only go down to 1.5, we need to see the treasury rates get up above 1.55% and stay there for the rest of the quarter. Uh, I would say with the amount of uh, fiscal stimulus and quantitative easing, it's hard for me to see that happening. But then again, anything can happen in this environment. But Either way, the trajectory for the discount rates is, is headed down. All right, so now we'll talk about the all others category. So uh, this is anybody that uh, it was under the age of 50 as of December 31, 2007. And so ultimately we can't control when your birthday was, uh, but you know, if you were born after 1957 or hired after 1997, uh, this is when these rules went into effect. Now, with this age group, uh, the, the, the math is actually different. Um, so for anyone in the all other category, we use three segmented rates that are based off of high quality corporate bond yields. Now, these rates get published by the IRS every single month. Uh, it's not something that we can easily track every single day. But that said, I, I will also give Pete credit. We've done a really nice job of tracking the rates relative to what their targets have been. And uh, we're, we're, we're able to give an indication, at least on the direction of rates. Now, the important thing to notice for this age group is that anyone who's in this category, the only uh, time frame that, that impacts the net preceding quarter's discount rates is the last two months of the quarter before. So uh, for example, right now we're working on the fourth quarter rates. April had no implication on what the actual discount rate will be for the fourth quarter. It's only gonna be determined off of uh, May and June. Just as with the third quarter rates, they were only determined off of February and March. Now we've seen some pretty historic movements in corporate bonds uh, over the last several of weeks. It's not because of, of the amount of money that the Fed is injecting or, or all the fiscal stimulus, but ultimately what happened in the, in the end of March was the panic that the market drove where people were selling assets no matter what they were, no matter what the price, because they just wanted to get to liquidity. Well, if you think of it in the sense of if you're going to sell something, you don't care what your price is, you're just willing to, you just want to get out, well, you're going to reduce the price. There's an inverse relationship between bond prices and yields. And so as someone's willing to sell something at whatever the price is, they're going to discount their price. It's causing yields to spike. And so that's exactly what we saw happen in, at the end of the month of March. Now, uh, I'll talk about the segments here in a second. But yeah, the other thing that's important to note with this all other categories is they actually use the IRS mortality table that's released by the IRS every single year at the end of the year, and it's updated every year at the end of the year. So with a longer mortality table, meaning uh, the difference between the, the grandfather category at year 2000 versus the current one that's being updated every single year, well, over the last 19 years, people are living longer. And so that is actually benefiting this age group. Now, here's a model of the segments, the three different segments. So the green is segment one, which is uh, mirroring short-term bond rates. The blue is segment two, which is mirroring intermediate-term bond rates. And then the uh, call it red color is segment three. 
And, and the concept here is, is that if you were to take a lump sum amount of money, there needs to be an assumed amount of risk that you're willing to assume to be able to invest that money. And so the IRS is just saying, or to me, the Pension Protection Act is saying that ultimately the first five years, which is what applies to segment one, would be short term. And so the first five years after you retire uh, has segment one applied to it, which is these rates here. Then segment two would apply to the next 15 years. And so basically, you'll see the blue line here and the trajectory that those have had. And then segment three would be anything after that first 20 year period of time up until the age of death. So to kind of use a, a real quick example, let's say you're retiring at 60 and uh, the current uh, life expectancy is age 84. So from 60 to 65 would apply segment one, from 66 until 80 would have segment two, and then 60, uh, excuse me, uh, 81 until 84 would have segment three. So you could probably imagine the, the, the segment that has the biggest influence is gonna be segment two, which is the blue one here. Um, now, what I will say is, is uh, we do send out projections of these, of these rates. Pete does a nice job getting them updated every single week. Uh, we have an email list that we send those out. If you'd like to get added to that list, please, please, please feel free. Um, add, you know, we're more than happy to add you onto that list. Um, and here's an example of, of one of those projection tools and, and what we're seeing happen for those rates. Um, and, and this is going all the way back to 2013. But we do know that uh, first quarter of 2020 was a new historic low that we had seen in terms of, of the discount rates. And then ultimately, we saw a little bit of an increase going into the second quarter, only 0.02%, uh, percent, which is not at all enough to justify retirement. And then in the third quarter, um, many of you who have been following the rates probably remember beginning of March, we were actually projecting a very significant decline, uh, probably anywhere from 35 to 40 basis points, so 0.4, um, into the third. And then ultimately with what happened uh, with markets at the end of the month of March, rates spiked up, so that rate differential dissipated a little bit. Um, we, are, uh, we, we do know, those are factual numbers, that there was a 14 basis point decline in the rates. So the third quarter is actually a new historic low for the all others category as well. And then um, we're now modeling for the fourth quarter. Now, as I mentioned earlier, April had no level of indication in terms of, uh, or implication, excuse me, in terms of what the rates are gonna be. Uh, we just know the trajectory and trend. And, and that's the main reason why we're modeling it. Now, obviously we've started the month of March and the month of March, gosh, month of March, month of May, excuse me, uh, the month of May as well as the month of June are going to be what determine the, uh, the fourth quarter rates. And so we're going to be watching closely in terms of what they have. But at this time, we've seen the markets normalize a little bit. We've seen the corporate bond rates come back to what we would call normal. And so we are projecting that the increase uh, is about 0.04 to 0.02. Now, these are even very different than where they were a month ago, because when we started the month of April, it was looking like we we're gonna see a one to one and a quarter percent increase. So rates have really, really come down. Um, yeah, people are asking me the question, is there a chance that we could see uh, fourth quarter rates be lower than third? You know, it, it, it's really hard to say, to be perfectly honest. And, and, and a lot of it is gonna be market driven. You know, if, if uh, we ultimately see a, a surge of new occurrences, sentiment shifts uh, dramatically more negatively again, markets retest lows, we could see uh, rates spike back up a little bit, uh, but at this point in time, it's not significant enough either for me to say to somebody, you've got to retire in the third quarter. But again, if you're ready to go and, and interest rates are something that you're watching and you're really caring about taking the lump sum, then this is something that you want to take a peek at. All right. So um, we get asked the question a lot in terms of, of how to determine the different segments, how to determine how the lump sum presentation is. And this is actually an example of the tool that Pete has built. Um, and this is just showing somebody who's retiring first quarter of, of 2020 at the age of 60. It is strictly an example, but uh, wanted to just kind of help with illustrating that point. So if you remember, I said segment one applies to the first five years, segment two for the next 15, and segment three for everything else. So here's actually an example of it over here on the right, where you can see the, uh, from 60 up until age 65 was, was segment one. Segment two was from 65 up until the uh, age 80, and then 80 and beyond was segment three. Um, now, what we're doing here is applying the discount factor, so you can see what the present value of the annuity payment is. You add it up, and you can see what the present value to get the ultimate lump sum number. 
Um, we also get asked the question of what are the sensitivities to my lump sum with interest rates? And so we wanted to help model that as well. Um, and, and this is just a continuation of the previous example. Uh, but ultimately what we're seeing here is, is as rates go up, we're going to see the lump sum go down. As rates go down, we're going to see the lump sum go up. And so, for example, if we see a 1% movement in interest rates, we're going to see the lump sum go down by 0.94%. So it goes from a million dollars down to 905. Um, at, at that level, and that employee's level of compensation, that's typically relatively significant. And it's usually enough of a driver to induce a retirement. But they do go the other way. So if we see rates come down by 1%, those lump sums go up significantly. And that's ultimately what we've seen for the last year and a half. As rates have continued to go down, people's lump sums have continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, but general rule of thumb, a 1% movement in interest rates is about a 10% change to the lump sum value, roughly. Um, and, and obviously that's linear, but it's one of those things that when we have the conversation around lump sum versus annuity, we need to have a clear understanding of, of a person's comfort level with risk. And, and ultimately, if we're going to take the annuity, interest rates don't matter. They do not matter at all. Uh, there's no implication on uh, what they're going to do in terms of the, the uh, pension amount. And so when we're having that discussion of, of lump sum versus annuity, for me, it's very much what we would categorically call an emotional versus financial one. Emotionally, it feels very, very good to have the guaranteed payment. Financially, though, when we look at where the current discount rates are at, uh, we also look at someone's life expectancy and, and assuming that they're okay with some level of risk with their with their portfolio structure, then absolutely uh, the lump sum right now at the current discount rates is, is favored from a financial perspective. But again, it all comes down to someone's comfort level with risk. Um, I, someone asked me about investment structure. I'm going to come back to that right at the end, uh, but I wanted to just kind of give you kind of the framework for how we, we help with making those decisions. Now, the other question that I get is, uh, comes down to when should I consider delaying the pension? Now, many of you may or may not know, but if you retired at the age of 55, ExxonMobil actually imposes a 5% per year discount on your pension program. Um, if you think of it linearly, that's 0.125 per quarter in terms of reduction. Now, they do prorate the entire amount, so I was just trying to use a, an example from a, from a linear perspective. But if we're seeing rates, for example, go up by 0.04, and ultimately we know by continuing to delay taking the pension, we're gonna get 0.125 back quarter over quarter. Well, to me, that still makes sense to go ahead and work. Um, obviously, it, 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 many of you who have been to our events before, uh, you might have heard me use my joke, but I, I, we like to say that the financial planners in us will have you work until you're 80, you die at 81, We'll also have you save every dollar that you make and leave, leave nothing left to live on. Um, terrible joke, but there's a lot of truth to it. And, and the point with that joke is always working longer means more money, right? Yeah, I mean, if you work longer and you die quickly thereafter, you're going to have more money. Uh, you know, and, and the biggest trigger for that is, is what you spend. <laughs> and so the, the more you're working, you're having cash flow offsetting what you otherwise would need to pull on your portfolio. Now, the conversation with regards to delaying really is, is there because we're trying to reduce that 5% discount. And, and so when we're trying to make that decision, you know, first I'm gonna say, do you need the money right now? And, and if you're under 59 and a half, well, why would we touch it anyways? I know 2020 is, a, is an unusual year because of the CARES Act and there's a, a forgiveness to be able to take money out of a retirement account without a penalty, but that's not normal, right? A normal year, if you're under the age of 59 and a half, you have to have pay a 10% penalty if you take money out of retirement accounts. The only exception to that is the savings plan where you can take money out once a year, penalty free. You still pay ordinary income, but it's penalty free. So the conversation around delaying taking the lump sum, well, first and foremost, it's if you're under the age of 60, you don't need the money. And if you're taking the lump sum and you're expecting interest rates to either stay flat or continue to go down. You know, we had a lot of folks actually a couple years ago where rates were, uh, kind of trending flat, if you will. And then ultimately that when they got to the age of 60, it was kind of like, all right, should we still continue to delay? Well, then we ended up seeing interest rates come down after that and ended up working to their advantage to go ahead and, and continue to delay because of the lower interest rates. I uh, had a question come in here. Uh, do you have a sense for the solvency of the funding of the ExxonMobil's pension? Uh, they recently sent out a statement, but I have not attempted to analyze it when the company's struggling when the company's struggling financially, I've heard horror stories in the past where companies' pensions are underfunded. Uh, great, great question. And yes, they, uh, they just sent out their 
2019 uh, pension uh, status update. And, and ultimately, uh, ExxonMobil is obligated to maintain at least 80% of what their outstanding pension obligations are. Now, there's a couple different things that they put out with regards to that, that uh, statement. Now, they, they did give us three years of history so we can see what level of funding that they've had for the last three years. Um, ultimately, they are anticipating, 20, uh, based on the, the 2019 update, that pension obligations are, are going up. And I think that's also, first and foremost, um, because of interest rates. Uh, as interest rates have come down, it's actually brought up the amount that they're obligated to pay. Now, ExxonMobil historically has been very, very good about funding their pension program. Um, there's two categories there, um, credit addbacks and non-credit addbacks. If you, if you look at the non-credit addbacks, it's basically saying that they have enough money in their pension program to pay out 97% of all existing current obligations. Now, at, at the end of the day, I will say the whole reason for the Pension Protection Act was because most companies who are offering a pension program were dramatically underfunded, and that's what really created a lot of the horror stories. You know, I, I'm not going to say that that it's it's risk free, right? I mean, nothing at the end of the day is risk free. Uh, but what I would say is is that ultimately the uh, pension uh, guarantee pension benefit guarantee corporation PBGC uh, does publish what they will ultimately cover in terms of if a company were de to default on their annuity payments and um, Okay, the numbers in that posting, I want to say it's roughly $5,500 for the single life annuity option if somebody takes it at age 65. You know, so some people have asked me, should I just take the annuity up to that level? Maybe it depends on your risk profile. Everyone's going to be a little different there. Uh, but what I would say is everyone's situation is going to be a little bit different. You know, a lot of times right now I'm getting the question, does, does lump sum versus annuity make sense? And as we can see with these discount rates being at historic lows, it does favor the discussion around taking the lump sum. Now, ultimately, like I said before, it comes down to risk. Uh, the only criticism I could ever give about ExxonMobil's annuity is, is twofold. Uh, there's no cost of living adjustment associated with it. And then ultimately, if you pass on uh, before you live to full mortality, then there's left left behind. Now, there are annuity options that have guaranteed payments or guaranteed number of years, but um, we do need to do some analysis specific to your situation to see what makes more sense. All right. Um, this is just a quick illustration of a timeline of what it looks like. Now, part of our process is, is to help our customers with building out the timeline that makes sense for your situation. Um, we're really giving an illustrated example of somebody who wants to retire in the third quarter. Uh, so this would be a September 1 benefit commencement date for, for all of the uh, non-grandfathered folks. For grandfathered folks, we have the option of waiting until September 30th and having a, an October 1 BCD. Now, the reason we would do that is because we're going to try to target the fourth quarter rates because we're projecting fourth quarter rates are going to go down for, for that age group. But ultimately, uh, with regards to requesting the package, um, you need to request the package uh, 120 days out as the soonest that you're eligible to request it. So for a September 1 BCD, the May 1st was the earliest you were eligible to request the package. Uh, you'll need to know the three critical dates in writing. Oh. Done a typo here. I think I had that typo before. I need to fix that. Um, but when you request the package, then then uh, it takes them about three to five weeks to process the package. So anticipate if you requested it the first week of May, you're going to get it in the end of May, early part of June. Now, once you've done that package, we need to sit down and and. Our preference is to actually do this with you uh, because these are some irreversible decisions that we're making. Uh, but we're, there are some forms that are going to need to be signed and notarized. So first off, we're going to need to choose, are we going to do lump sum or are we going to do annuity? Um, we're going to need to sign and notarize that. We're also going to need to sign the qualified rollover form and notarize that. Uh, there's an address verification form that we want to do. I also recommend that we do the direct debit form for anybody who has a supplemental pension plan or an additional payments plan, or if we're doing an annuity. Um, if you do have a supplemental pension plan, there's an additional form that we need to complete. And then lastly is the direct uh, deposit form. I also recommend that. Now, in order to get benefits processed on time, they need the, the paperwork needs to be back to the benefits group 35 days prior to your benefit commencement date. So uh, we, we recommend July 24th, uh, to get those back if you're looking at third quarter. Now, um, then we kind of go a little bit in limbo uh, for the next month. At the end of the month, 
Uh, lump sum rollovers uh, will be delivered. Usually they come right before the BCD. So you'll see them like September, uh, um, uh, August 29th, August 30th, right before uh, the, the first. Now, if you have a supplemental pension or an additional payments plan, both of those will be direct deposited into your checking account. Same with a supplemental savings plan. Now, um, we always want to recommend get the, get the checks deposited as fast as you possibly can, whether it's uh, delivering them or we can send UPS overnights. And then at that point is when we want to meet finalized cash flows, investment strategy, tax strategies, and then we'll start having discussions around um, your 401k, specifically if NUA still makes sense. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about NUA because I have a full presentation on that, but um, it's not until you're officially in the system as retired that you're able to be able to uh, do a rollover call. Now, I'm a big believer. We got to be very, very, very uh, um, uh, committed to what our strategy is with regards to the 401k. The default option is leave it there. We want to know for sure what are the tax implications of what we're doing. Does it make sense to, to take advantage of NUA? Does it make sense to use after-tax money, have it go to a Roth? All of those are the types of discussions that we're gonna need to have. Uh, but like I said, we can't do it until afterwards. All right, um, I had a couple questions come in, so I wanna make sure I get these. Um, my fiance suggested I take the lump sum and put in safe in, in investment account CDs or an index fund, what do you say? So uh, the answer is I would really need to understand your risk profile, but I'm a firm, firm believer when it comes to anyone who takes the lump sum and actually anyone who takes the annuity as well. I want to have a cash buffer a set aside and established for a predetermined number of years. Now, for like a, a moderate risk investor, I want to have a cash buffer of roughly three years worth of your expenses. So if you're spending 100 grand a year, I want to see about 300,000 sitting in a safe and secure type of place. Now, it doesn't necessarily need, mean it needs to be in a savings account or a CD. We might look at some short duration, um, high quality bonds, give us a little bit more yield, especially for like the, the, the 18 to 36 month time horizon. But, but ultimately, it does come down to your situation. Now, beyond the first three years, I do believe it's appropriate to have income engines. Uh, and, and an income engine could be a, a, a higher quality corporate bond. It could even be a, a big dividend blue chip stock that's paying a very good dividend income. And, and I call that the three to 10 year money. Now the 10 year and beyond money is where we could potentially start to introduce risk. Now that's a moderate risk investor. Uh, somebody who's a little bit more conservative, maybe we, we have more cash buffer sitting there. Um, so instead of three years for the cash buffer, we've got five years. And maybe now it's the five to 10 year money that's in more conservative types of bond investments. And the 15 and beyond is where we take risk. You know, these types of market environments are a reminder around risk. And, and people, for whatever reason, for the last 10 years up until COVID-19 hit, seem to have forgotten that recessions are real. Um, recessions are very, very real. Every one of them is different. The catalyst is very, very different. And ultimately you don't know you're in a recession until you're actually in the recession. It's important to have a strategy in place to sustain your cash flow, no matter what the market environment is. And I'll tell you, in a good market, we get criticized for that. We get criticized because we've got you know, more conservative investment structures that are there because, and it's not all growing. Well, truthfully, I, I mean, I get it, but we never know when these market environments are gonna, are gonna happen. And when these types of market environment happen, it really does a lot for the psychological effect to be able to know for sure this is where your cash flows are coming from and allowing the rest of the portfolio that may or may not be a little bit more volatile to have a little bit of risk. Um, and that actually is a nice segue into, you know, if there's other things that I recommend. You know, I, it's, I, I do believe in using index funds and low cost ETFs. I believe in being very institutional in terms of, of investment structures. I even like using individual stocks where they make sense. Um, but I also think it's important to still maintain diversification. So I, I, I'm not a huge fan of rolling the lump sum into the savings plan, strictly because the savings plan only has those seven options. I like the ability to move out to a custodian, a Schwab, a Fidelity, a TD, open up the universe where you're able to get these things. I mean, right now, for example, you're able to get a Schwab S&P 500 index fund with a 0.03 internal expense ratio. It's not that much different than the equity units, for example, in terms of cost. Um, so I think it's important to maintain a very diversified approach, but I also don't like the fact that within the savings plan, you only get two trades a month and you only get the average price the following day. So with having it in a, a brokerage account, whether it's an IRA or an after-tax account, 
you have a lot more options, a lot more flexibility. I do think it's important to stay diversified. Uh, a great example, honestly, is on the fixed income side. You know, the bond units are tracking the Barclays Corporate Bond Index. Bond units have a nine-year duration. Um, personally, I'm not comfortable taking on duration risk right now. And, and I know I'm kind of jumping over around a little bit. But with a nine-year duration risk means that those bonds are going to be more sensitive to interest rate fluctuations. Now, they've benefited tremendously for the fact that interest rates continue to go down. But at some point in here, rates are going to go up. Now, it's impossible to know when that's going to happen. But I don't necessarily believe in taking full duration risk right now. So those are just a little bit of a tangent. I'm happy to have a discussion one-on-one -on -one about what I would say is appropriate investment allocation for you. I did have another question. Um, I do the math on, on an annuity, monthly gross uh, times 0.16x number of years. Um, okay, what does that look like in the, in the form of a monthly check? Let's say the math says 5,000. What does the check look like? Um, Honestly, I don't understand the question. Um, why don't I, I reach out one-on-one um, -on -one just to make sure um, I'm not misspeaking here, uh, but I'll, I'll reach out to you. Um, do you have to know the, the rate of current, how, do you have to know the rate for current assets at this time? I don't totally understand that question is, oh, for common assets I'm, is what I'm imagining it is. Um, common assets has been coming down significantly as well. The last I saw was 2.24, uh, but that was, I believe, seven weeks ago. Uh, so I have not seen a, uh, um, I haven't seen the updated yet. Um, I'll check and follow up with you as well. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's just kind of wrap up a little bit in terms of strategies now. Um, it's important to have a plan, uh, create a budget, Understand your cash flow needs and anticipated future expenses. Understand your risk profile because risk profile ultimately is going to help with determining the decision on lump sum versus annuity. You know, and if your goals and time horizon have not changed, your investment portfolio should not change as well. Um, your risk profile should always incorporate short-term goals as well as long-term goals. And, and I would also say making decisions, investment decisions out of emotion, whether it's fear or greed, are not long-term investment strategies. And so we wanna keep the, the, the long-term perspective in sight, but it also have the short-term goals planned for. And, and all of that comes into this discussion of lump sum versus annuity. Um, oh, I'm just noticing my upcoming event slide is not the one I changed it to. Uh, we do have some upcoming events. I'm doing them every week right now, uh, and I'm gonna to continue to record these. So if you're not able to attend, uh, we'll be sending out the invite next week. Um, but uh, please feel free. I'm going to start updating them on the website now that we're committed to doing these webinars more frequently. Now, uh, one of the calls to action for many of the events that we do, um, we offer absolutely no cost, absolutely no obligation, the ability to sit down and run your numbers. Um, just at a minimum, it can give you a data set check. Uh, we could also look at your situation. And if you're actually considering hiring an advisor, we'd love the opportunity to talk to you. Um, this is uh, my team here. Feel free, please, to reach out to any one of us. Uh, we're delighted to be of assistance for you. And uh, if there's anything that I missed today, please feel free, send me a note. I'm delighted to, to respond. And um, most importantly, stay healthy, stay safe, stay well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in person again, um, but we'll obviously accommodate with the times that we're in right now. But uh, we're always here for you. Thank you very much. Have a great day.